Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss a relatively new study that discovers something entirely new about the origins of Pluto, and something that was kind of hinted on before in some of the previous studies, but was not actually known until, I guess, now. And that's because, according to this recent study, Pluto and its moon Charon might have been created in a very unusual way that's completely different from what's expected and from what was previously hypothesized about various objects and their moons, including objects like planet Earth and our moon. With this new bizarre formation theory, now referred to as Kiss and Capture. And so yeah, maybe I should have waited until the Valentine's Day to make this video. It does have a perfect title. But in reality, this is actually a really intriguing proposition that actually explains a lot of recent objects and a lot of recent observations, and also explains the famous observations from the New Horizons mission of the object known as Arakoth. And so let's discuss the study in a little bit more detail, starting, I guess, with the study itself. You can find this in the description, but it's a study by Adin Denton with the title Capture of an Ancient Sharon Around Pluto. And so let's start with the Pluto system first, basically focusing on what makes this system unusual and what the scientists believed must have happened here to essentially form it. So first of all, as you can see from this simulation, the largest moon of Pluto is large enough to basically tug on the Pluto so much that it starts wobbling around a central point referred to as the barycenter. And on top of this, there are actually additional moons, all discovered in the last few decades. And so because of the way Pluto and Charon orbit around one another, and because they're also tidally locked and seem to actually have extremely similar rotation and very similar orbital parameters, for many, many years, it was assumed that maybe the system was formed in a very similar way to how, potentially, Earth and the Moon formed. Here we're talking about some kind of a collision between two objects that basically mix together, resulting in the production of two objects with a very similar orbit. Now for Earth, this is the so-called Theia hypothesis or the giant impact hypothesis. The hypothesis we recently discussed because it's now being questioned as well. But in essence, we know that giant collisions definitely happen in the solar system, and so it would not be surprising if something similar happened on Pluto, resulting in the production of its moon. And because Pluto's orbital axis is basically directly aligned with Charon's axis, it suggests they might have started in a very similar point, eventually spinning out to the outskirts and moving farther and farther away. In other words, the evidence pointed at some kind of a similar origin from a central point in the middle. And any alternative explanation here would not make sense. For example, for Pluto to actually capture this moon directly, it would have to be much more massive. Now this obviously happens around other objects like Jupiter and even Neptune, but the mass of Pluto is just not enough to capture Charon by itself. And so the only explanation that kind of made sense, explaining the orbit, similar axis of rotation and relatively large size, would of course be some kind of a collision. But in a lot of previous studies, there were actually two potentially erroneous assumptions. The first one was in regards to velocities. And that's because at these distances, and even farther away in the Kuiper belt, the collisional velocity would be much, much, much lower, and thus the energy produced during this collision would be lower as well. But on top of this, there was also an assumption in regards to composition. The material strength was underestimated or completely ignored, basically assuming that something similar to what you see right here would happen around Pluto as well. But we know that unlike planet Earth and unlike even the Moon, all of the objects in the Kuiper belt and all of the objects on the outskirts of the solar system are generally very small and very cold. So they are unlikely to behave like these unusual fluid-like objects that Earth and the Moon might have been four and a half billion years ago. So they're basically unlikely to be warmer and much more gooey and more likely to be crystallized and hard. And so these fluid simulations that you observe right here, this is the one from NASA, would not really make as much sense. And that means that different simulations and a very different analysis would have to be conducted in this case. Which is exactly what the researchers just did. They basically focused on two relatively hard, relatively cold and slow moving objects with the diameter of 2400 kilometers and 1200 kilometers, with a distance between them approximately 20,000 kilometers. And they wanted to figure out what would happen or how to form these objects through some kind of a slow speed collision. But one important feature they wanted to recreate is a perfectly circular orbit at the end. Here the eccentricity is extremely low, which is actually somewhat unusual for any orbiting objects. And so by taking all of these details into account, the results were kind of surprising. Surprising because here, Pluto and Charon were not behaving in the same way 
as simulated with objects like Earth and the Moon. Here, the collision did happen, but because it was much lower speed and because the objects were much harder, it sort of created this really bizarre formation you see right here, with two objects basically coming together, or I guess kissing. A happy Valentine's Day if you're watching this on February 14th. But then, more intriguingly, very likely remained completely unchanged for a very long time. Because the strength of these objects and their overall density stopped them from changing further and from combining or from falling apart. And though this might not make sense right away, it makes a lot of sense once you combine this with some of the previous observations and some of the recent studies, one of which you can learn about in the video in the description, that surprisingly discovers that this unusual kissing phenomenon is super super common with a lot of these Kuiper Belt objects. As a matter of fact, several centaurs, or objects orbiting between Jupiter and Neptune, turn out to be similar in shape as well, and we know they came from a very similar location in the Kuiper's belt. Likewise, several comets were confirmed to be by Lobo 2, with their origin basically in the outskirts of the solar system as well. In essence implying that this bizarre, snowman-like formation seems to be super common and seems to happen to a lot of different objects in much colder, much darker conditions on the outskirts of the solar system. So basically here, when collisions do happen, instead of combining into a larger chunk and instead of basically becoming a larger spherical object, they instead become snowmen. But turns out that some of these snowmen eventually fall apart. And though it's not entirely clear why Pluto and Charon fell apart, chances are it might have been because of the change in orbit and because their spin possibly changed over time due to further collisions, or maybe because of some kind of an internal change. And once the spin of this central object became fast enough, they became two separate objects with additional particles on the outskirts forming the other small moons. Which is why researchers now refer to this as a kind of a kiss and capture scenario. Not a hit and run scenario or grace and merge scenario like in some of the previous explanations, but basically a third type that seems to mostly affect objects on the outskirts or objects with different composition. In this case, this was achieved using an advanced impact simulation on the University of Arizona High Performance Computing Cluster, where the simulation first produced a contact binary that later separated, forming the exactly same orbital configuration once enough time passed. And because recent research does suggest that these contact binaries seem to be super common, here this explanation makes even more sense. But also suggests that these two objects extremely likely never really mixed much and actually maintained their own composition, remaining their own separate objects even after they separated. And if this hypothesis is correct and confirmed by other studies, it basically implies that everything after a certain point in the solar system seems to combine and produce larger objects in an entirely different way from what we actually expect in the inner solar system and possibly produces a lot of additional unusual interactions that we never really anticipated. And because in previous studies the physical properties of objects have never really been considered the same way, it does mean that this study very likely discovered a new way for objects to merge and to create bizarre orbital partners. This actually explains additional discoveries from the last few years, including similar objects with similar orbital parameters, such as the object you see right here known as Orcus, another bizarre dwarf planet with its moon Venth that actually shares an extremely similar mass ratio to Pluto and Charon, even though they are slightly smaller in size. And they do have extremely similar circular orbits and obviously their origin was previously kind of unknown. But here this explanation also makes a lot of sense for Orcus and Venth. If you've never heard of this object before, there's a much much older video somewhere in the description talking more about this because this object is also technically known as anti-Pluto. It's basically extremely similar to Pluto in every single way except that it's literally on the opposite side of the orbit. Which is already kind of bizarre and obviously raises a lot of questions. Here's roughly how their orbits compare to one another. And there are actually some other TNOs or trans-Neptunian objects with very similar orbital parameters and very similar massive moons. So this could be technically an extremely common phenomenon that was just discovered through the simulations and through the analysis in this study. But here there are obviously some unanswered questions. One question is in regards to the other moons. So assuming this is all correct, does this basically mean that all of these other moons are essentially the leftovers from the collision that appear as the ring of particles around the central object? And if so, it means that these similar objects must exist in other systems and we should be able to discover them as well. Likewise, did this actually have any specific effects on the surface of Pluto 
and did the heat from the impact somehow influence the features we observed with the New Horizons mission, and if so, how? Lastly, one of the conclusions from the simulations was in regards to the increase in temperature following this slow-speed collision. This model discovers that during the collision, the internal heat in Pluto and Charon had to have increased by at least 100 degrees Celsius, 180 Fahrenheit. And because these objects are basically made of ice predominantly, it must have had certain effect on the internal composition and possibly even on external features. And the question is, what exactly did this do and how can we discover any of this? For example, did this actually influence the internal oceans inside of these objects, which have been hypothesized in some of the previous studies you can learn about in the description, or did this change these objects in some other way? Now, we don't really have any answers yet, but assuming the study is correct, these are some really important questions to ask, and we'll definitely come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.